welcome to Launch, the GCC podcast. I'm your host, Marty Duran, Director of Communications for the Great Commission Collective. We're a global network of churches partnering together to plant churches and strengthen leaders. So really, thanks for uh, thanks for coming on today. Um, My pleasure. Adam, Thank you, Adam for Ramsey. Me. You are uh, you're in the Brisbane, Australia area. Uh, you've written a book called Truth on Fire: Gazing at God Until Your Heart Sings, published by the Good Book Company. Um, man, it's just um, it's, first of all, it's good to hear your accent. It's good to it's good to talk to someone that doesn't sound like me, which is <laughs> even in the states is not really hard to find <laughs> because I have such a draw. Um, but uh, your book is uh, is really encouraging. So I wanted to ask you uh, a couple of things right off the bat. First, tell everybody a little bit about yourself. You're you're uh, you're probably not as well known here as you might be there. So start with that. Tell everybody a little bit about yourself, and then just go right into why you felt compelled to write a book about the Bible. Mm. No, thank you, Marty. It's great to be with you, and and for what it's worth, I love your accent. I mean, I'd put that on any <laughs> awesome. audio Bible and uh, listen to that when I get up in the morning. That's just a great Southern That's draw. Cool. Um, in fact, I wish that Australians incorporated the word "y'all" into our our um, our. You can our, do it. Be I, the trailblazer. I, it's, it's, I think it's it's become too Americanized. It, we we uh, would feel like we were selling out a little bit if gotcha. we did it, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but we shorten every word anyways. So yeah. it feels like just a mess culturally uh, <laughs> as a country. So I'm working on that. Uh, so I uh, I spent uh, a number of years in, in uh, America, in Denver, Colorado, a little bit in Portland, Oregon, uh, a few years in Seattle during the final years of Mars Hill as one of the elders mm. over there. And, and some of those times was just uh, high school. Some of that was in uh, church planting ministry. Uh, some of that was a teaching pastor to students uh, in a, a large, uh, well-known multi-site church that is all over the podcast world at the moment. And, and I'd come from a... Uh, kind of a classically seeker-sensitive, attractional church kind of upbringing uh, mm. through my childhood and got exposed to uh, this world of, of Reformed theology in all the good and in the, the bad kinds of that world. Made me wrestle through a lot of my own beliefs there mm. and kind of came out of it with this convergence of appreciating a lot of the uh, experiential realities of mm. my childhood and teen age years, but feeling like something was missing, right? And yeah. then as I'm exposed to this world that had this high view of the scriptures and of, of uh, theological clarity and of biblical literacy and uh, of, of, you know, getting it right, um, mm. theologically speaking, and valuing that, but then frequently finding that there was this absence of joy uh, mm. in that tribe and, and this absence of uh, healthy emotion and healthy Christian experience within that world. And, and more and more, I found myself kind of living in this weird space of, of trying to convince your, um, your, your thinker types to, mm -hmm. uh, to feel and to rejoice and to smile mm -hmm. and to experience uh, the truth that they cherish and to get the more feeler types to, uh, to think and to think yeah. biblically and to ground all of those experiences in the scriptures themselves. And that was what kind of led to uh, the formation of this book. Okay, so um, gazing at God's word until your heart sings. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of the chapter titles and then kind of let you uh, talk about what, what they mean and, and uh, why they're important to you. Uh, God is other the experience of wonder and God is sovereign the experience of assurance. Um, Talk us through uh, why those two subjects are important. Oh my goodness, they're so important. So, so the book is basically about it, it's what I tried to do, Marty, was to look at the attributes of God in a way that you know when I read Toza's classic, uh, you know, the knowledge of the holy, mm. and and uh, and Pink has got a great book on on um, the attributes of God, and and as I've read some of these these great books there, what wasn't often there after this this brilliant um, you know articulation of who God mm. is was what's the experience of the Christian life, the lived experience that that truth about God is meant to lead me into. And so, so I was thinking through these things and going, well, as we think through 
you know, say for example, the 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 otherness of God, or the more theologically correct way to say that would be the transcendence of God, the godness of God. The more I understand that, the more that truth about who God is is meant to lead me into a lived experience of wonder. Mm. Uh, that thing that so often becomes a casualty of us growing up. Uh, in in Christ and maturing and and going further in the Christian life, we can so easily lose that childlike sense of wonder at just the the grandeur of God. Mm -hmm. Uh, And in the same way, as I look at the sovereignty of God, when I rightly understand that, uh, as the Bible portrays God's sovereignty, uh, that's meant to lead me into an experience of assurance. He's got this. He's on the throne. He knows Mm -hmm. exactly what he's doing. He's got a great plan, and he's going to do his plan. That means that I can rest in the assurance that God has this, uh, and so on and so forth with the various chapters. We look at uh, 12 different attributes of God and these different experiences that, that understanding that, that attributes meant to push me into in the way that I live before him. It sounds like you're addressing um, kind of holistically um, this idea that, that we are embodied that yes. that we're not disembodied spirits flitting around like when Scrooge looked out his window and saw all of the bodies floating down the street at Jacob Marley's behest, but that our bodies are meant to interact with God in some way. Our whole being is meant to interact with God in some way, and that you're pushing the reader to acknowledge that God is more than a set of facts that I learn about yes. him, no matter, no matter how broad that set of facts might be. Uh, he's, and our relationship with him is more than that. Is that kind of where you're pushing us? Yeah, that's that's spot on, Marty. So, so I think it's one of the great tragedies of where we find ourselves. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's so many tragedies of where we find ourselves right wow. now uh, <laughs> in our present uh, moment in history as the church. But I think one of the one of those tragedies has been the divorce between theological Christianity and experiential Christianity, and mm. and so for me, it's it's you know a a a, a cold. Uh, but theologically accurate um, uh, Christianity is just as big of a fail as mm. a Christianity that is radically on fire about nonsense. Uh, mm. And the Bible just doesn't let us make that dichotomy um, as we're, we're reminded over and over again. We're to lo- love the Lord our God with not just all our heart, but with all our mind. We're to be sober minded in our thinking, but also there's this clear sense of a healthy emotional life uh, mm-hmm. and a healthy relational life in our, our one anotherness as God's people that they're meant to go together. Mm-hmm. So so I think, you know, the- good theology matters, but it's just not the, it's not the end game. Uh, yeah. it's, it's meant to move us rightly toward God and a right experience of him uh, he's the end game this is what you say on page 20 it's time to leave our fears behind by seeing how we can have both rather than having to choose between the robust and the experiential if right thinking is the hearth then the right experience is the flame we need both without the hearth our spiritual experiences can run wild leaving many burn victims in their wake Without the flame, our magnificent theology is cheapened into a nice decoration sitting pointlessly and lifelessly in the corner of our lives. That's good writing as well, dude. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, I, I believe skip, that. Yeah, I want to skip over um, because you you mentioned the uh, the experience of joy. So one of your chapters is called God is Happy, yeah. the Experience of Delight. And I think if there's one chapter that the, just the, the content jumps out at me as needed, It's this one, because we live in a world that presses against joy. Uh, The world that we live in doesn't doesn't propel us to joy. It propels us to worry and heartache and heartbreak. So why is it important, A, to remember that God is happy, and B, that it's okay if we're happy too? Yeah, that's great. Uh, I I mean... No surprise. I loved writing that chapter. That one was just so much fun <laughs> to meditate on the happiness of God that's great. And, and the experience of delight that that's mm-hmm. meant to lead us into. So, so none of that minimizes the reality of suffering. We talk about that in the book. None mm-hmm. of that minimizes the, the good and right place for lament and grief um, and how we face the, the, the shadows of life uh, in a sin-fractured world. Uh, all of that is still part of our lived experience as followers of Jesus. But 
it's so important that we remember that God, that there's no one in the universe that is happier than God is. And if there was, we would have a major theological problem. <laughs> so, so it's just worth remembering that, that, that if there was someone who embodied happiness and delight and gladness and joy, all of these words that the, that the scriptures kind of put together in this category, mm -hmm. um, we, would, we would be in big trouble if God is not the be-all and end-all and source of all happiness. And so it's, it's remembering. Here's why it matters, Marty, because... Think of it like this. Um, when somebody uh, uh, calls you to come toward them, you know, and let's, let's just say that the phrase is, is come here or come over here. That person's disposition really changes the way that we hear those words. Mm. So, you know, by themselves, the words come here are pretty neutral. But if the person saying those words has this scowl on their face and this furrowed brow and, and you can see like there's violence in their eyes mm -hmm. and, and it's, come here. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, we know, okay, well, I'm in trouble right now. Right. This, this, this person's <laughs> going to do harm to me. Uh, they're going to lacerate me verbally. They might physically mm -hmm. abuse me. I mean, this, this could be really bad. Yeah. Um, but if you flip that, and if the person who says come here has, has a smile on their face, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's now, it's, it might be the invitation of, of a parent to a child. Uh, inviting them in for a hug, or it might be the right. invitation of, of of a husband to his wife, or a wife to her husband. Uh, that's the invitation, the invitation of of a lover of intimacy, mm -hmm. and come here radically changes with the disposition of the one speaking. So if we have a view of God that He is constantly uh, scowling, or or just just there's this sense of perpetual mild disappointment on mm -hmm. his face about us as his people, mm -hmm. then we're not going to hear his invitation that uh, is so repeated in the scriptures of come here, draw near, come to me. We're, we're going to hesitate on that uh, or just draw near half-heartedly. Yeah. So, um, so God is not face palm Jesus. Yes. <laughs> It's, 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 um, I, we have such a terrible picture of Jesus, uh, so, so much of the time. And, and it's almost, it's one of the reasons, I don't know if you've seen the, the TV show, The Chosen. Um, I've really enjoyed it. I usually kind of stand Christian media. Um, mm -hmm. so this is the, like one of the first times I haven't hated Christian media. Um, but I love it because it humanizes Jesus in a way where you see him delighting, um, yeah. in life and in relationship and humming and interacting in, with children and bantering on the road with the disciples. And I think a lot of us might have grown up with a distorted picture of what yeah. Jesus is like, that he was somehow just aloof, um, mm -hmm. you know, this aesthetic, this, uh, that, that, this, this, this guy that was kind of detached from everything and, and always frustrated with his disciples and always, you know, just kind of disappointed there. Um, and it's worth us remembering that Jesus was fully human, and that mm -hmm. means he fully understood the range of human emotions. And yes, uh, absolutely, he was the man of sorrows that you know Isaiah fifty three describes him to be. But but again, that's that's not talking about the entire life of Jesus. That's speaking to the last day of his life. Yeah. That is a messianic description there of Jesus in what he is doing for his people. So so I think our problem with hap with 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 we get suspicious with, uh, I think, applying happiness to God um, because we think, well, how, how, how could that be? Does that feel trite? But if we have anything that we're running to for our happiness beyond Him, uh, we've entered into idolatry and, and all sorts of other theological problems. Yeah, I think there's some theological projection going on, too, with that, because we feel guilty about being happy, even about good things sometimes, and we project that back on God. That's there's right. no way God could be happy about stuff, because I'm certainly not happy about this. So I want to um, change gears a couple of times uh, right quick. And one, I want to mention the style uh, of your writing. Um, you don't hesitate to bring a little humor or written one-liners into you're writing like you're a little Michael Bird disciple over there in, uh, <laughs> on the East Coast. He's uh, cheeky. Yeah. Yes. Uh, he, he is. Uh, I love him. But uh, so I do want to mention that the book is, is well written. So it's not dry. Uh, the book itself has got uh, good turns of phrase. Uh, it does bring a smile even as you're reading. 
Um, so I commend you for that because a lot of um, more devotional type books uh, suffer from the thing that we're just talking about. It's almost like you can't write with humor if you're writing about God because right. they're, they're two different categories. So I commend you for doing that. Second, uh, talk a little bit about um, you're part of a church planting group. Uh, a network of sorts, I think. Uh, if that's not right, tell me, and we'll just stop that right now and <laughs> do something else. <laughs> but uh, so you're either at a multi campus or you're kind of leading a church planting network. Is one of those accurate? Uh, a little bit of both. So, okay. so I, I I pastor a church called Liberty Church on the Gold Coast, and we've sent out uh, two church plants uh, in a family of churches model. So it's a pretty uh, decentralized, uh, locally elder led, but we share some resources and, and yeah. branding and uh, and teaching series and things like that. That's all done live by local elder teams. So so uh, so that's the local level uh, side of my ministry, and then on a, on a wider scale, I serve the X29 network as the network okay. director for Australia, New Zealand, and Japan. And so it's really focusing in on just church planting across denominational network and church planting across the Asia Pacific region and, and just trying to resource uh, church planters uh, to plant mm -hmm. well and existing churches to send well. Excellent. So um, final thing, and this is really just to give some people an idea of your context because um, Every part of the world is different than every other part of the world. And so if oh, we yeah. can find out some stuff about Australia, that'll be good. So um, Australia's a lot bigger than most people realize. And mm. your population per square mile can't be but like 0.8 people or something like that. Because th everybody lives like on one side or the other. And there's <laughs> like just not a lot in the middle. Um, so talk a little bit about strategically what uh, like a church planting effort for the majority of the Australian population would kind of look like. Yeah, that's so so Australia is is a massive piece of land. It's 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 essentially almost identical to the continental US, uh, the yeah. 48 uh, with I mean you got 300 plus million people, we have maybe 30 million. So wow. so about a tenth of the population and everyone lives uh, in that equivalent there from New York City down to Miami and 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 Southern California and yeah. that's it and and the whole middle is basically either uninhabitable desert uh, or or hundreds of thousands uh, of square miles uh, of, of farmland mm. and uh, a very a very sparse population there so it's so like my state alone uh, the state of Queensland where we are is two and a half times the size of Texas. So it's just a huge, wow. huge piece of land. So for us to, to partner well in church planting, we're doing so across a massive geographic context that, that sometimes is uh, within the same state, a 30 hour drive uh, to get to a different part of that state. So, so what we try to do is to, to really create solid regional hubs uh, where, where our church planters and those churches can connect well. There's training. We try to leverage the online piece and, and, uh, and create cohort sort of setups mm -hmm. there where like, like DNA and like context, uh, uh, churches and pastors can sync up and troubleshoot what they're working through and pray for one another. So, so we've had to be creative in that sense, but we definitely don't have this oversaturation uh, mm -hmm. of churches. We need tens of thousands uh, of more churches that will plant churches that will plant churches mm -hmm. over the coming decades. And uh, uh, we would be probably closer to Canada as far as the uh, how secular our country okay. is in the, okay. the scheme of things. Uh, so we're, we're very different to the U.S. in that regard. Okay. So the book is Truth on Fire, Gazing at God Until Your Heart Sings, Adam Ramsey. Thanks for hanging out today, man. This is a blessing. Hope you have a great evening because it's like bedtime there. It's like 1130 at night, but I've heard your voice, Marty, and I feel ministered <laughs> to just from that drawl. So I'm going to go to bed and sleep well. That's awesome. Thanks, man. Thank you for listening to Launch, the GCC podcast. If you haven't subscribed already, why not take a moment to do that in your favorite podcast app? Also, rate and review the podcast when you get a moment. That helps us with search results and recommend us to your friends, maybe other pastors that you know who will benefit from the content from this podcast. 
Also, don't forget to check out our website if you haven't done that already. It's gccollective.org. That's gccollective.org. And there's a lot of helpful information. There's articles. There's how you can join the GCC, whether a church planter or an existing church, and plenty of other content that'll help you grow spiritually and encourage you in your leadership journey. 